Hello and welcome to the Ask the Industry podcast, episode 84. I'm comedian Simon Kane, and for those of you new to the show, this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand-up, comedy, radio, and today, podcasting. Well, that's actually underselling him. He is influential on the stand-up circuit, on the touring circuit, on the writing circuit, and in podcasting. Richard Herring is a comedian, writer, and podcasting pioneer. He's been performing comedy for over 25 years and is known for his strong work ethic and his drive to perform, taking a new show to the Edinburgh Fringe every year for a decade and then extensively touring it. We talked about how he juggles and manages so many different projects as well as his family, his anxiety and a bit of mental health stuff concerning his downtime as well as his latest show which follows on from uh, The Best Show and how that's playing on his mind with audiences' expectations of what they're going to get after a show that he's actively toured and said is his best stuff. I loved it. I think if you're interested in podcasting or building an audience online or if you just want to hear how a comedian deals with pre-show jitters on a tour show that didn't sell very well, those are his words, not mine, uh, you're in the right place. I felt I just really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed talking to him and getting some information about what it's like producing content, putting it up there for free, and the weird act of faith that you have to go through to hope that people will give you their attention, because that is currency in this day and age. That is the most important thing, which is why I'm going to keep this intro as short as possible. If you're listening to this when this has come out, myself and Richard are both at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which starts in a few days' time. So if you'd like to see his show, he is at the Pleasance Courtyard every single day at 7.30pm doing a show called Oh Frig I'm 50. And if you'd like to see me, I am at Sweets Venue at 5pm every single day except Wednesdays when I am rudely awakened by the dust. <laughs> oh god, that's going to get old by the end of the fringe with my flyering technique. But it's every day except Wednesday when I get rudely awoken by the dustman. If you uh, want to reserve a seat for mine, it's £5 uh, or you can pay what you want on exit. And Richard's uh, prices vary on the day, depending on what day you go and see him or whether it's a two-for-one thing. So if you have a look in the show notes, you'll be able to see all that information. But for now, this is Richard Herring. Um, The reason I began podcasting was um, because we sort of realised how easy it was. I'd done a radio show with Andrew Collings, and um, I'd sort of come on and done half an hour with him about the papers in his Six Music show. And then that had ended, and we'd sort of missed it. I'm thinking we hadn't done it for a year. We'd always enjoyed doing them. And then he basically did a podcast for Word magazine and realised that you just needed a computer and a nerd. Uh, and so we thought, oh, it might be fun to do it. Uh, and I think initially we sort of probably thought, hey, look, if we do this and, and people hear it, they might give us a radio show again, which did eventually happen. Uh, but then I sort of quickly, I think, realised um, that it was just more about the you know, the freedom to do whatever you wanted to do. So kind of quite, well, I think we started quite sensibly and then uh, about episode three or four, I called his mum a fucking idiot. And from then, then from there on in, it was uh, sort of realising the freedom to, you know, you sort of, it was very much the Wild West, you could say what you wanted. And I think you sort of still can really. Uh, and it's uncensored and, and no one's uh, arbitrating it apart from yourself. So I kind of liked that autonomy of it. And I kind of recognised, I recognised that it was, I had loads of ideas for stuff and you sort of tried to do them on radio and TV. And even if you're successful, it takes ages and often someone interferes and ruins it and then, you know, or it doesn't happen at all. So it's just the immediacy of being able to do something um, really easily and put it up was, yeah. uh, was what appealed to me, I think, initially. Yeah, because you because you've always done radio and TV up to that point. Yeah, so you you've sort of seen it from both sides. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I'd done lots of TV and uh, and radio in the nineties, and then you know, I was still doing stuff in the. I started podcasting uh, in two thousand and eight, I think. Um, it was because it was the uh, I sort of met my wife, and me and Andrew started podcasting in more or less the same month. Um, so it's nearly ten years ago, uh, and. Uh, yeah, it just I I you know I was still doing radio shows and the odd bit of telly, um, but it just felt like I was having lots of ideas that weren't being picked up, but that I thought were good ideas. And also, it was it sort of I can't can't quite remember the timing of it, but it was around about the time that um, the Saxgate thing happened as well, and then the ra- radio got very edgy about anything. Even like the, I remember doing a panel show. And them saying, don't swear during the warm-up in case there's a Daily Mail journalist in who will, you know, give the BBC a hard time. So the BBC was so frightened um, of, uh, you know, anything that could be a bit controversial. So to be able to do something, you know, so with As It Occurs To Me, which was a couple of years down the line of 
doing stuff um you know i just thought oh this is great i've got the freedom to do whatever i wanted but actually with that freedom you kind of quickly go oh actually you know there's no fun there's no fun in it if you're allowed to do it so you sort of can't you know you calm down a little bit and, and uh and create your own parameters but uh yeah so it was, it was all it was all those things but it mainly you know it was i wasn't getting overwhelmed with work and i was and i was struggling a bit to do the work that i want that people wanted me to do and i didn't quite know what direction i wanted to go in with my career so i was doing stand-up again and um and I just, it felt more like stand-up. You know, stand-up's great because you just come up with an idea and you go and do it. And then if the audience like it, it's successful. And if they don't, it's not. And I kind of like that about comedy, that it's sort of self-perpetuating and uh, self-regulating. It's got its own barometer. You know, it's probably the only job in which you're assessed every single night you do it as a stand-up comedian. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the podcast felt like the same sort of thing, really. So initially it was with Andrew. And then, you know, I thought, thought well, there must be more scope. I still feel there's a lot more scope to podcasts than really anyone's doing maybe the americans are starting a little bit more but i think you know you can sort of do your your own tv and radio shows of any kind you know whereas it, it is mainly people chatting yeah no yeah. I, I was thinking about that before where because where, you started sort of you're sort of always looked at as quite a pioneer of podcasting but you sort of started in 2008 and obviously it's, it was it was around a lot longer yeah, before yeah. then so were, were there any podcasts you were listening to that kind of made, made you think oh, I've got I really want to this is so easy to do this is no I, d- I didn't really listen to podcasts before it, and I didn't really know what, much about them so I knew they existed and uh, I've subsequently Ricky Gervais's one was the kind of probably the first one that people really got behind which I then you know I did listen to some of that and it's really good um but no, it was just, you know, it was just we realised we could do it and it felt like a bit of fun. And then, I you know, I sort of, re- and as it went on, I realised there was a lot more to it than just it being fun and being a way of, um, well, you know, I've been doing, I've been writing a blog since 2002, which is, you know, again, not quite the first person to do it, but certainly, you know, amongst the first people to do it and certainly one of the rare people who carries on doing it, certainly every single day. Um, and... Uh, you know that was a good I felt like when I started doing that I thought well this would be a good way for, to get people to come to the website every day and be able to publicise my stuff and I suppose with podcasts I sort of quickly realised you've got an audience there and we quickly kind of got into the the iTunes top 10 and we're, you know, we're amazed to see us coming first in the iTunes top 10 which is you know I don't quite understand how they judge it but of course there, weren't, there wasn't all that much competition back then but it meant that everyone was you know everyone who listened to podcasts was sort of listening to us uh, or lots of people were, and um, and I sort of very quickly noticed when I was touring, my numbers were suddenly, you know, doubling from the quite small numbers. We're we're, the, we're going back in time a bit today because we're in Radlett where I've hardly sold any tickets, so this is a bit like a 2008 gig. But I would <laughs> I would do you know I do a lot of gigs of 30 or 50 people. And then within two or three years of starting the podcast, A, you'd meet loads of people who go, oh, I love the podcast. And your audience would be 100 to 200 or 300 to you know. So it really helped, along with other things, it really helped build up an audience. And I kind of realized it was a sensible, I've sort of realized subsequently it's it's a sort of sed- sensible business decision. Um, but I'm not a businessman. And I never thought of it like that. I kind of thought, it, I've just got idea. Some people go, well, why would you give stuff out for free? And you go, hey, well, it's just dicking around. So it's not like, and in that dicking around, we created, you know, like Hitler Moustache came out of a, pod, a Collins and Herring podcast where I, where I suddenly decided to scare him by having a Hitler Moustache for no reason. And then we started discussing that and then that became that show, you know. So it was a great way of generating material. It was great of generating an audience. And then, you know, you give something away for free and then people generally will feel embarrassed if after a hundred hours of it and give you a pound yeah so you know and that's actually but then you know, i sort of realized that's all you need and that's what uh, if if the podcast could really work and it still doesn't quite work like this um if everyone who listened gave me a pound a year or a pound a month i could do absolutely any you know i could create anything i wanted to i could be doing movies basically if i got a pound a month from everyone who listened you know so and that doesn't seem unreasonable for you know 25p an hour or something you know so um i think that's still and i and i feel that will still happen with podcasts or some internet based entertainment it feels like you know it felt very much te- five or six years ago like this could be the beginning of the movie industry you know this, this is ch- someone's going to be the charlie chapman who gets a dime off every single person who sees his film and is a millionaire within a year and you know obviously that's happening on youtube and things like that but generally from people being sponsored rather than ever you know if, if, if you could find a way of making the listeners understand 
if they would all just give a tiny little throwback to you, even if it was 10p, you know, every time they listen, then uh, then that would lead to be able to do amazing stuff. But it's sort of gradually, you know, we do, I've managed one way or another to fund things. Yeah, I think. Um, but so yeah, but it, but initially, well, I just didn't care about the money. I didn't care. I just thought this is great. I've got an, a, a, you know, I've got a platform to do comedy. But then I suddenly realised, hey, this is you know, a, I'm getting more people coming to see me on tour. B, you know, in 2009, 2010, I started getting invited back on all the panel show. In fact, not invited back. I was never really on them before, you know. So I was on uh, Buzzcocks and have I got news of you and stuff because of the podcast. I think you know. So it led to other work. Um, and it just, you know, and, and I think it sort of does work as a, I didn't think about it too much and I never, and I sort of still don't think about it too much for fear that I will ruin it if I think about it too much. But, you know, it does, it does sort of work. Accident is a great business model because, you know, people, and most people are decent at the end of the day. But what I like about it as well is that, or, you know, almost socialist thing about it is that it's free. Everyone can listen to it and people who can afford to pay should maybe pay a little bit for it. Uh, and but I, you know that's why I've never got into really charging people uh, at source because I want everyone to be able to listen to it if you know even if they can't afford to pay for it. It's, yeah, it's about value giving yeah. online, which is sort of the thing that uh, I think traditional outlets are kind of losing out on at the moment because they're sort of chasing clickbait. They're not sort of trying to provide any form of value, which is yeah. why indie creators are actually making better content in some instances than some of the more established yeah well you know but you've got that's as a creative person you're always fighting against that um you know the, that wall of executives that in a tv channel or a radio channel uh you know who telling you that you need this sort of thing or that sort of thing or want this sort of thing or don't want that kind of person so what i love about it is you know if you're not in vogue or if you're not if you've got ideas that are, yeah. If you've got ideas that uh, <laughs> that wouldn't work on TV, like playing yourself at snooker uh, endlessly, um, then you can still do them. You know, so that as a creative person, it gives you the opportunity to uh, try stuff. Um, and you know, and that it just depends. If you, I think, if you want to be paid and if you want to be famous, podcasts probably aren't the way to go. But if you want to be creative and you want your stuff to be out there, and if I just sort of realised with stand up, you know, all I care about, I didn't care about. Um, thousands of people coming to see me all I care about is having an outlet to do that do my stuff so if 10 people are coming to see me in a little pub I'm still able to perform to them and that's enough for me mm. um, and so it's, it's not that I wouldn't perform to 3,000 people if 3,000 <laughs> people ever wanted to come and see me but um, you know so just I think it was realising that there's this outlet for stuff and you know it's your own channel and it's incredible when we started in the 1990s if you wanted a radio show you had to work and get a radio show and you know we somehow managed to do that but God knows how we did it and um, and then you know you would do t t 20 radio shows and be judged on those but now you can do a thousand radio shows of your own and put them out and learn and get better and you know and do whatever you want to do mm. so you know it means people can no longer sort of do is that it's that thing isn't it people to go oh, i'm writing a novel but no one will ever publish it but you know now you can do everything yourself so there's no excuse yeah totally yeah it's back it is. <laughs> um well no i was going to ask because your podcasts are so different to your sort of uh, idea driven show because they're, yeah. they're so specific do you find that you get people coming and sort of not enjoying it because they, they were expecting the podcast or they were expecting I something I think more like that. they come expecting not to enjoy it that much and, and think <laughs> it's better than they thought it was. I think really, you know, I think they think it's going to be, because the podcasts are so slapdash yeah. and the character I play on the, slop, on the podcast is largely, you know, either just childish or, you know, deliberately not funny or, you know, or there's, there's, there's lots of sort of levels to what I'm doing, but it's a different thing that I'm doing in my stand-up. So I usually find people who come to see the stand up are just sort of surprised how good I am at stand up. Mm. Because again, you know, if you listen, if you listen to the Less Square Theatre podcast, I th I think you've got to understand the distinction. You know, yeah, you can't compare uh, like a podcast to a TV show with loads of writers and loads of time and loads of budget. Um, but also, most of my podcast stuff is pretty much in, either entirely improvised or written the day before. So the, any stand-up I do at the beginning of the Less Square Theatre podcast is literally me making something up in the moment. You know, I might thought, oh, on the tube, I might thought, oh, maybe I'll try and talk about that, I'll try and talk about that. It's the way you write a stand-up show, but you don't usually broadcast the first time you try that stuff. So, you know, a lot of those things will fail, and then some people go, oh, Rich Chang, I've heard Rich Chang stand-up on the Less Square Theatre podcast, and it's not very good. Yeah. Um, 
but then if, they, if you came and see me do a home show you would hopefully go oh that is good so yeah I don't think you know I think maybe sometimes people are expect wanting to you to do ham hands and whatever and shreks and stuff which I don't really do in any of the in any of my life stuff but um uh, you know, I think, but also I think it attra- I, I've, my audiences have always been really great and interesting and, and clever people, which I'm very lucky about. And that's, you know, there's there's loads of things you, you know, you, I think as a younger man, I was more ambitious and you want to be that big star and you want to have thousands of people come to see you and, uh, and loads of money. And then actually you sort of realise I'd rather have this sort of tight group of you know a small number of people that it seems to be growing but who you come and if other acts are on with me they go your audiences are so lovely they you know they get comedy and they're not cunts <laughs> and uh, you know so in a way you know by doing it really slowly and building up this audience i've got a lovely audience to play to who can get where i'm coming from you know and even if you even if you know that and a surprised rather than being disappointed it's not like the podcast i'd, I'd, I'd surprised and delighted that it's something a little bit different than the podcast yeah yeah i i I think a lot of people perceive it as because you've been going quite a long time by the time you started podcasting that you were quite established which meant that yeah. you co- kind of had a, a leg up on yeah. some people starting would you say that was fair? I don't or? think it you know I, d- I don't it's a little bit fair but not really because like we didn't you know I think that's in terms of popularity Lee and Herring we never got we toured and not hardly anyone came to see us um, we weren't no well known um, so if anything I had to slightly you know and I was playing much more of a character in Lee and Herring than Stuart was and I you know I had to try to overcome that and, and find the real me or you know another real me uh, another character of me but also I just don't you know I don't think it's borne out we I was touring to 30 people coming to see me at gigs you know it was it was better than nothing but it wasn't a huge groundswell of uh, people yeah I mean you know it, I, I came out to do stand-up and the, there was a small advantage of I just you know I've been on TV four years before and so people wanted to give me gigs uh, and yeah maybe uh, to a certain extent it, it helped you build up an audience a little bit but I don't I don't think it's um, I don't think it's that big a difference and I think you can do it even so you know and I've been doing podcasts for 10 years and it hasn't you know it's only led to more podcasts it's, which I'm happy with because <laughs> I'm enjoying them but uh, you know it's not like I'm in mo- I'm not on most people's radars and I never was on most people's radars even when you know even when people would see me as being successful we would you know, we never won awards. We were never in that in crowd. We never invited. You know, I was never invited onto panel shows. Uh, never invited to act in other people's things. No one ever came to see us live, really. So, you know, I think we were we were like a minor success. But yeah, maybe in podcast podcast terms, that was enough to give me. You know, I suppose more successful people wouldn't be doing podcasts at that time, and less successful people might find it more difficult to get an audience. But I also think if you do a good podcast, people will find out about it pretty quickly. And you know, and you can build up from nothing in, with a podcast, but also learn what you do. You know, in, in a way, you don't want people to hear your, your early podcasts. Yeah, I think you know, if you're a twenty-year-old kid starting out, a young person, sorry, starting out, and um, you know, you, you're still finding your feet. I'm g- delighted the stuff I did when I'm twenty isn't available <laughs> freely online. You know, some of it's around if you really <laughs> struggle to find it. But um, you know, it's it's you you make mistakes, mm. so. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it was good. It was good. To, um, the probably the main thing was I had what was it, f- fifteen years of being a professional comedian was probably more useful than any fame I had, which was minor, I think. Uh, if you were starting again now, what would you do differently? As a pod in podcasting, yeah, I would be twenty years younger than I was when I started. Um, you know, I think that's all, all I think about is it's a very. Long, but I think again, most most of a creative career is this is you know it's a long game and it's not just about being successful very quickly it's not about being lauded really it's about learning how to do what you're doing so i kind of the only my only regret about podcasts is that i didn't what it wasn't able to start doing them um 10 or 15 years earlier because i think it would have given you yeah i think i'm going to run out of steam and run out of uh runway because i'll be dead (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> whereas you know i think someone starting at 20 i think could uh, could have a 20 year career that then f- blossoms into something like amazing but I, after i've been doing podcasts for 20 years i'll be you know 60 mm. so you know i might still be podcasting but i, don't, I think it it gets uh, harder to um build up the energy and time to do it i suppose so um 
Uh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I think you uh, even the things that don't work and the mistakes you make, I think, are just sort of vitally important in, in becoming in learning what to do. So there's no point saying I wish I hadn't done that because by doing that thing that was bad or that didn't work, you learned a lesson that you wouldn't have learned if you hadn't done the thing. Mm. So all the all the ups and downs kind of help to make you what you are uh, and hopefully make you um, better at what you're doing. So um, can't think of anything. Uh, what would, is, there, was there, is there anything? There was something that I. And I well, the thing I regret most about my career is not doing stand up earlier, really. And so it's, it's the same thing. If I just wish I'd. I didn't like doing stand up. And if I'd just persisted through my 20s at doing stand up, I would have had 10 more years of being a stand up before I then started being a stand up again and would be better at it, you know. So mm. that's all. I think just having had more time to do it would be would be good but you know hopefully i will live till i'm 100 and then i will have enough runway to you know that's it's the it's the potential i'm, I'm not i'm not good at networking i'm not good at pushing myself and i'm not i've i've the, the probably the um the thing i have that uh, in, uh, aside from maybe not being talented enough uh to, that means my career uh doesn't go as well as some other people's in that in those terms is that i think i i sort of believe things should work on fairness <laughs> and i have that kind of sense of decency that i think it should be you should work and it should be your turn and you should mm. and if you're good you will get noticed whereas actually you know the people who push themselves and are ambitious and say hey i'm great look at me i'm clever and great you must come and see me actually end up doing better than the people sitting back going oh people will realize i'm good if i sit back <laughs> and just do if i just i'm good for 20 years people will realize that i'm good but it doesn't really work that way so yeah. you know, maybe I'd be more pushy, but I, if I was, if I was more pushy, I wouldn't be who I who I am. So it, it, you know, and I really, it really suits me, and it especially suits me now. I would ten, twenty years ago, I would have wanted something different. I would have looked at this and gone, "Oh, that's sad and pathetic." But you know, I would rather be known by a small amount of people who really like what I'm doing and get what I'm doing, and you know and you walk down the street if they recognize you it's hey hello <laughs> rather than be known by millions of people some most of whom don't really know who you are or don't really like you that much so you walk down the street and you go is that what wanker fuck you you know you do gigs and, and half the people are just come to see because you're on the telly and then you do something a bit esoteric or weird and then they're angry so um you know it's it is worked out very well in creative terms and i, I make a very nice living and i uh, create nearly all my own work and I have a kind of anonymity in real in the real world, which I really value. Uh, because, you know, I've got to get a child now and just being out with your child, you, d you don't want to be the centre of attention, you know. You don't want yeah. to, you know, don't want your, your fun time with your family to be interrupted by loads of people coming up and going, I think you're funny. <laughs> so uh, that doesn't happen. So it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally someone goes, I'm listening to, I'm listening to you now. I'm listening to you. Which is weird for them. <laughs> um... Well, you you make a lot of content. And, yes, I and, do. And you and you put you put it all out pretty immediately, yeah. or very quickly after you've made it. Do you find like you're good with like downtime, or you're good with like taking breaks, or and how do you not get burnt out? Um, it's it's difficult not to get burnt out. I think and sometimes I do get burnt out, and I have been burnt out at times. Um, and I'm not very good at downtime. I, I but I kind of you know I like my job, and my job is my hobby at the same time. So it's just the difficulty is when sudden, you know, like actually <coughs> just as this year, at the start of this year, we're doing As It Occurs to Me, which was a massive undertaking, you know, a crazy undertaking, really. I should never have done it. Uh, it was great. We got kind of £100,000 from Kickstarter to do it, which was amazing. But that's not enough to pay myself anything for doing the, any of the writing of it. Uh, and there's a lot of writing of it and a lot of work in it and, and for everyone. And then we, you know, uh, channel, the Channel 4 picked up and wanted to do a taste tape of a uh, sitcom I'd written for them. And Radio 4 wanted me to write a sitcom for them. And I was on tour uh, and I was doing, you know, all the other stuff and the Less Square Theatre podcast and everything, you know, coming out. Uh, and it was just like crazily too much stuff. But in a way that I quite enjoyed, to be honest. But it, but it was just like that was nuts. So, it's, you know, you, and you just have to, and I've got a family and I want to make sure that I'm there for my family and I'm making sure that I'm not um, working all the time. So, but, you know, you're self-employed, so you have to, when certainly when the paid work comes in, you have to sort of take that. When it comes up, you can't go, oh, no, actually, sorry, because two things have come at once. I'm going to turn down this uh, this opportunity. So, you know, it's, it's difficult, but, I'm, I, but I also, um, and I, I have lots of ideas, and, and I'm, you know, and I'm happy to churn it out. And I think that's why the Internet's good, cause, and it may be bad as well, because uh, it means I can churn the stuff out and maybe 
in some ways it might be better for me to take one idea and really work it up beautifully and present it somewhere uh, but the, that can't really work on the internet because you can't you know I can't spend well apart from as it occurs to me but yeah, I can't keep on doing that I can't spend eight months creating one thing and with as it occurs to me I spent eight months creating you know eight hours of comedy so it's not there's still the same <laughs> ethos of just chucking shit at the walls and hoping it sticks um, but you know I think you have to do that and then with the with the paid stuff I can you know with the stand-up shows and with the scripts I'm writing for the telly then I can take a bit more time to make them you know what I would do if I had time to to do something so if someone's paying me a little bit so yeah I think I, I like what I'm doing and I'm kind of do, have a lot of ideas but occasionally you know some when I wrote Time Gentlemen Please which was a, a sitcom I did for Sky I did 37 episodes in two years and it sort of I worked really really hard on it got paid really well uh, but also no one really watched it and no the reviews were sniffy and and I and I'd really put my heart and soul into it, and then you sort of and and we'd done Lee and Herring, same thing. We'd worked so hard on it, and people never, you know, we didn't really ever reach those, you know, those levels of uh, critic critical success and award success, which uh, sort of mat- mattered to me at the time when it wasn't happening. Um, and so you know, then you get to the point where why am I doing? You know, what's the point of doing this? And why am I working so hard? And blah blah blah. But you know, I'm actually now just at the point where I'm doing stuff because I, I really want to do it and stuff that I really like and you know you've, that's what you've just you've just got to I think my career's gone on long enough that I appreciate when you're when you're fortunate and it isn't necessarily when people think it is you know and in fact being successful and being rich aren't necessarily great things whereas being able to do what you want to do and being happy in what you're doing uh, is much more important. <laughs> so, uh, you know, even when I'm busy, even when I'm thinking, fuck, I'm doing all this stuff and I have to rush down the country and record this sitcom, and is you think, how lucky am I? You know, how how many writers and comedians would like to be in the position I'm in? How many writers, how many comedians would love to come to Radlett and perform to 60 people, you know? Uh, which I can be sniffy about because now I do better than that in most places. But then every now and then you just check yourself and go, you know, we've got, you've got to... You've got to appreciate what you've got. So, it's, you know, I'm incredibly lucky to be able to do this as a job. I'm incredibly lucky that anyone wants to listen to any of this stupid rubbish I put out. Um, and, uh, you know, and it, and I've been doing this job for 30 years and, and never really had a time where people haven't been interested in what I'm doing or where I haven't been making enough money to live. And so, you know, I, I think you just sort of appreciate it. So I don't really get, you know, I, I just sort of see it as I, I feel grateful for the... Um, for the opportunity and uh, yeah you know I'm uh, like I've got to write an Edinburgh show th- this year as well and you know there's a part of me thinking I haven't got any ideas and maybe this is it maybe it's over uh, which is very difficult when you're coming off another show where especially this show which is like the best material I've got and the most honed routines I've got you're going how the fuck did I write that stuff as I write at the start it's very difficult to to you know create that stuff so you worry about you worry about the ideas drying up but you know i think it's it's still that's what that's why i think to keep churning stuff out is helpful because you, you sort of think well look i'm creating all this stuff and 70 percent of it's all right you know and maybe 20 percent of it's better than all right so yeah yeah I, th- I think i think that anxiety of potentially not having an idea especially at this point in the year when edinburgh's yeah. looming is something that most performers kind of go through yeah. i mean you must be kind of used to it in a way by now because you did edinburgh for was it 11 years in a row yeah something? i mean i've done it but i've done 40 this is my 40th edinburgh show yeah. this year so yeah i've done it a lot of times but um but it never goes away because you never you know you always think you, you think oh i'd probably be all right but you can never be sure and then mm. you know the older you get you think what if i just stop being funny or uh, so at the beginning you think you know i've had a great show but what if i never have another funny idea so you know you and you've got to be like that's human and you need to, if you didn't think like that that would be worse you know it'd be worse you think yes i'll definitely be fantastic the last two or three Edinburgh shows i've written have been so easy to write um and have come together so fast partly because i just think i've done it so many times i know what i'm doing and yeah you know partly as i've had been quite inspired by things I, you know at the moment i'm not feeling massively inspired in for new stand-up but um uh, but you know everything. You know, I've actually had a very fecund period with writing the sitcoms and and thinking as it occurs to me, it's going to be good as well. So um, you know, it's it's. Uh, I'm not. I'm not I'm too worried about it. Mm. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't be. Uh, not <laughs> yet. Yeah. We'll see. You know, and, and I think that's the. But also, you just get. There's loads of. Things, oh, this is terrible. And, you know, as it occurs to me, loads of. I've got nothing. I've got nothing. But the hu- the I the humiliation of of that's what's you know. Actually, the podcasts are good because you know you know they're going out to people 
mm. and so you can't you you know as much as you can dick around and do some rubbish and and half-assed bits in it you have to make it good so you know that fear of failure is what sort of drives you on to hopefully not fail so you're, you're going back to because you took off last year from Edinburgh was it? I've taken two years, two years off, yeah. off and wh- what's making you go back like do you feel like you need to do Edinburgh still or no do I don't think you know I think those two years I've showed I don't need to do it because I wrote you know I wrote a brand new show without going to Edinburgh and that was what I thought I needed Edinburgh for um, but it's my 30th anniversary is part of the reason I want to do like a you know I did a show called Oh Fuck I'm 40 and I'm 50 this year so it felt like I should go to Edinburgh to do that show um, and you know it wasn't like I'm saying I'm never doing Edinburgh but I think you, you know I don't think it's massively uh, useful for me really you know it's it's uh, it's you, you know I, I, I it was you're better off I'm be- I realized I was better off in terms of just doing my show whenever I wanted to do it because I'm just all I'm doing is putting myself up against loads of competition and you know and in a, in a very economically stupid way of doing a show um, whereas if I do it on my own in London at any time I want then you know I'll make money as I do it and and uh, so you know there's there's loads of reasons not to do it but I just I really like Edinburgh and it's fun and um having had a couple of years off I'm sort of ready to give it another crack I think I had I had a bad year up there the last time but also it was good because I was taking a couple of big chances and they didn't really pay off but um but I'm glad that I took the chance you know so I lost loads of money doing a play and uh and the stand-up show was on late and didn't do as well as usual um even though I think it was a really good show so uh you know it's uh it's difficult but then I, you know I, I still love Edinburgh and I think it's it's given me so much uh, and you get so much out of it really I think anyway just in just in terms of seeing other stuff but I think it does pay for itself you know you can say oh I lost 40,000 pounds this year but I've made money other years but also you've made money through getting work other years and meet and, and having ideas and uh, learning what you're doing so you know it's it's good to have something to focus on and go hey I've got to you know I think again if I didn't wasn't doing Edinburgh this year, I think I might struggle to write a show because I think, well, what's the, what am I working towards, you know? Mm. But now I've got to have a show by August, so, you know, I, and I've said I'll do it, so I've got to do it. I kind of wish I hadn't now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's a good it's a good yardstick. I think most comedians, like, work to that, like, year to year. Yeah. And and I know you did for, for like, sort of, you did 11, 11 one-man shows. I did, right? Well, I did, like, 11 years in a row, but I've yeah. done, but I also, you know, I did, um, you know, I did every year. I, I missed five years in total, until I had these two years off, so I've missed seven years since 1987. You right. know, but I, but I'd basically I'd, three of those were early 90s. So from 1992 onwards, I've missed two two Edinburghs in however many years that is. So it's um yeah, so I'd missed three, I think, and then I missed two. Uh, I missed 2000 and 2002, and then I've had I don't know. So, but, so I was still doing shows every year. So I did Christ on the Bike in 2001, I think was it, or 2000. And, and then had and Christ and then talking cock and then had a year off, um, so yeah, two thousand one, two thousand and two, and then had a year off. Uh, so you know, I was doing one man shows. So I did. I've done uh, twelve one man shows in fifteen years, and and two of them I did again. I, I did the second. T- so I did Christ and Mike and talking cock again, just so I could get them on DVD. Really, if you were starting now, so if you were back when you were maybe maybe when you were starting as a solo performer rather than as a double act, yeah, would you have gone to Edinburgh if it was? 2017 when you were starting that um i mean i would because i think the, what the thing is about edinburgh is really is better for new people and what it is it's about learning how to do the job again it's the same thing so it's better that edinburgh has no value in terms of making you successful because you should be going to edinburgh for five or six years and just trying stuff out and that's what we did to begin with it was just there was less people around so if you did something quite good you got noticed quite quickly and you know we got we did get noticed through edinburgh and through other things um, but I think it's better, you know, something like the free fringe, go to Edinburgh, don't spend too much money, make lots of friends, see what other people are doing and learn how to do the job because however good you think you are, and even if you're brilliant, you'll get better by doing it for t- 20 years. Mm-hmm. So if you spend, you know, I think like, I, I just think as young comedians and I was the same, you go, oh, well, you know, wouldn't it be great if I did this show and someone from the telly came and said, come do your own TV show. It wouldn't be good. You know, in the first year, it would be a bad thing, however good you are, because you'll be better in five years' time, mm. and you'll have more stuff to do, and you won't just explode and disappear because you'll you'll have worked uh, up a certain amount of stuff. I would say twenty, thirty years, really, ideally, but you know, it's not really uh, workable. 
Yeah. Mm. Um, you also tour pretty much after every show. Yeah. And I read that uh, even in 2012, so like quite recently, you were just going around on your own, driving to places. Yeah, yeah. How, how did you deal with, like, because, uh, like, I, I presume f- from an outsider point of view, people would more have a perception of, oh, he's got a touring crew and he's doing all this, you know. Yeah, well, it's always been a small thing for me. You know, we, when we did Lee and Harry, we had a tour manager and a support, so there were four of us, sometimes five of us if we had a, someone else along. But, um... Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's not economically viable to do much else. So you can, and now I can afford to have a driver, and I think I need to. You know, I think I think once I got over, you know, once I got into my 40s, it became more difficult. I still did a couple of the tours on my own, as you say. But, um, you know, you're just too tired to do the shows properly because the driving's really difficult. <laughs> when you're 35, you can drive back from Yorkshire and back to Yorkshire the next day, you know, and... Mm and still be okay um but it's just a, you know so in, prof- in just terms of keeping the show professional you want to not be too knackered out uh and because i'm more people are coming i can afford to pay somebody to to, to come along with me but yes yeah, you know it's a solitary but being comedian is a sort of solitary experience mm. so all that's part you know you're just basically doing a gig and then going to a hotel and not really and you know you have a an hour and a half where you interact you know you're interacting with loads of people but you're not on any kind of level with them you're not socializing with them and you can't really socialize with them after a while because it's too weird so you know because that you they've just paid to come and see you and they are like are a fan of what you're doing and so if you go and have a drink with them they'll just be asking you more about yourself which is probably not what you want to do okay if you're in your downtime yeah, yeah. Some people might want to, but I would. I don't want to go out for a drink with some comedy fans who want to talk to me about, you know, the Simon Quinlan sketch or something. You know, if after I've just done the gig, yeah. <laughs> I don't mind talking to you on Twitter about it or whatever. Uh, but uh, you know, or, or just being in that position where someone's going, "Oh wow, you're amazing!" Going, "No, well, I'm just, want, I want to have a drink now." You know, mm. so you end up going and sitting in a hotel and having a drink on your own, or just going to bed and not being able to sleep because you're full of adrenaline, or driving home or whatever. Yeah, so it's uh, you know, it's a solitary and weird thing, and it, you've got that difference between, you know, the being the centre of attention and this amazing room full of laughter and then being somewhere on your own, which is why loads of comedians go mental. <laughs> well, I was going to ask how, you're, how, you're, how you deal with that mental health kind of fluctuation. Well, you know, it's easier now. I'm a bit older and, you know, I've got, now I've got a much more solid home life. Uh, so I'm working for my family and, you know, there's a reason to be doing it and I've got something to go home to. Uh, it's difficult, more difficult when you're away because you have people to miss more than you did. But I was probably more depressed when I was, you know, like 2007 maybe when I was sort of touring on my own and had nobody at home and was nearly 40 and, you know, just getting drunk and wondering what my life was going. Um, so, you know, that was sort of properly depressing. So, the, you know, you just got to get a grip of what, what it is, you know. So you not, the stuff on stage isn't real. The reaction is nice, but it's not real. Either way, if it's good or bad, it doesn't matter. Uh, and, you know, you're doing a job and then you're just a regular person after that job. <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, so it's just... And, and then you get used to your own company, I suppose, and so it's all right. Um, I don't, still don't love it. I don't love, you know, I try to get home if I can after gigs. I don't love staying in hotels. Um, you know, and when you're in your 20s, it's exciting. You know, you're going, oh, wow, we get to go, well, we get to stay in a hotel and stay out and do what we want. And, uh, you know, we get to fly around the world. But now if someone says, do you want to go to Australia to do a gig, you kind of go, oh. <laughs> you know, there's a lot, of, that's a lot of hassle. Whereas 15 years ago, wow, I get to go to Australia with my job and I don't earn anything, but I don't, you know, I'm getting a free holiday. Um, so, you know, things change. And uh, and I think you just, you know, I've just, you become, hopefully become a bit more centred, but a lot, not everyone does and not everyone can cope with it. Um, I think, again, I've been lucky because I've had a taste of, like, being almost famous and I've had uh, experience of being worrying whether it's going to carry on at all and so to be in a position where I can tour and people come and see me and I make a nice living and I have a nice ha- family to go back to uh, and you know and I'm not too worried about uh, finances yet you know but you know you never know where I just need a bad year and it's all fucked up but um, you know so it's it's I think again you sort of appreciate how lucky you are so you stop mo- moping about the things that you know, people. I mean, you see on Twitter a lot of people going, "Oh God, no! I've got to go and do. This. I'm doing this and I'm doing this. I'm doing this and I'm working so hard. And, oh, it's all my life's awful." You kind of go, "Yeah, but that's what you can't complain about those things. That's what you wanted." And also, there's loads of people sitting. There's loads of other comedians sitting at home, 
going, you know, I would love to be doing the things you're doing, so don't, like, make out that you're complaining. And you're not really complaining about it. You're showing off about all the stuff you're doing. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, it's you know, I think that's what you realise. You realise, you know, I think you've got to re- count your blessings, realise how lucky you are, and stop competing with other people and only compete with yourself. And a lot of comedians c- can't leave that competing with other people behind. So you're never going to be happy. I talked about it in one of the shows. I may be unhappy now about sort of seeing you know seeing comedians at the, at the Jerry Seinfeld show and the most famous comedians in the country all in this after show party all kind of looking over their shoulders all kind of assessing which of them was the most successful and looking at the person who was more successful and being jealous of them and you kind of go you've made you've done it you've made it why are you why are you still doing this so you've got to shake off that and uh, you know and so like it's I've obviously my, I've got a double act partner who is perceived as being a lot more successful than I am in terms of being a stand up which I think is is true um, and you know you could let that get you and destroy you but I A find it funny B I'm, I'm pleased for him on the whole uh, and uh, you know it's but also it's not uh, you know the competition if it is a competition the competition isn't over but it isn't a competition and you know the, there's no reason to compare yourself to other people you've just got to keep on doing what you're doing and do it as best you can so otherwise it just it would drive you nuts and destroy you so um you know that's what i think i think by having some knocks and by being and the self-obsessed thing person that most comedians are and getting over that hopefully a bit you can sort of hopefully get better at coping with loneliness and uh, or solitude you know we just become solitude it's not it's not a bad thing i've got a child so a night in a hotel can be quite a nice a break but like two nights in a hotel it's like oh i wish i was home with my family <laughs> so it's you know it's uh it's still not easy but it's um but you know it would be churlish to complain about being able to tra- travel the country and perform in my own right in my own shows and sometimes have 600 people come and see me and sometimes have 60 people come and see me. in terms of um i mean does it ever annoy you when people say you know oh when they compare you and Stuart Lee well it used to and and it annoys me only in that it's it rarely seems to be oh they probably uh, have similarities because they worked together for 15 years or you know it's never like I wonder if Stu is is doing that because it's something that Richard did you know so there there seems uh, sometimes it's uh, it's aggravating to to be when people when reviewers will kind of go oh there's clearly some influence from Stuart in this and they never do it the other way and, you know, and I know the truth and I know that we both influence each other. And the reason our acts are similar is because we work together for 15 years. I never even go, to, you know, I never even see his stuff because I don't want to, um, you know, have that uh, hanging over you that you're being influenced by the other one. Um, but, you know, I ne- we're never to win through a lot of the same experiences. So, but no, but, you know, it doesn't, I'm, I, I think you've got to look at Stuart and um, he's... He should give hope to all comedians because you know he's stuck to his guns and done what he wanted to do, and um, has made it really succe- you know done it very successfully, uh, and uh, and hasn't had to compromise. So he's a kind of beacon of hope that you could do that and still be successful. Mm. Um, so no, you know I'm not it's it's in, and also there's lots of you know I think as a stand up yeah he's he's an amazing you know but we do what we do is still very different but he's also done stand up for 15 years longer than i have um so and uh you know it, comedy isn't just stand up and there's other things that i think i'm better at than him that and other things that um you know so it it it's it's a whole picture but also i think it's about how happy you are in yourself anyway so so you know i'm not i'm del- you know i'm i can look at all the stuff i've done in my career and be quite proud of the stuff I've achieved uh, and so I'm not going to let any you know other people want you to be angry and want you to be bitter about it and I'm not saying I've never been you know jealous or envious but you just get to a point where you, there's no point in doing that and you know I'd, ra- I'd, I'd much rather be me than him so <laughs> <laughs> fair enough so, yeah. how, how do you not get bored of doing your show well, because you again, you just you concentrate on the on, on making it better every night. So uh, the technical challenge of it becomes really I- interesting. And so even if you do exactly the same stuff every night, it's different every night because the audience is different, and also you find a different way to do it. But you're basically juggling 
10 or 15 different things as a performer. So there's the words, there's the way you say them, there's the, way, what, the pauses, there's what, how you hold your body, there's what you, how you gesture, you know, there's all these different ways of doing stuff, you know, and delivering a line in a different way. Last night in um, Camberley, it was sort of like a really tiny gig again. And I just, you know, you're, you're just finding, you know, doing a routine I've done maybe three or 400 times and just finding new ways of, of lightening it or darkening it or saying, you know, just the tone of it, not even changing the words. Sometimes you change the words. Um, so, you know, I find that idea of perf- trying to perfect the show and th- that's what's fun about it. You're doing it night after night and you can remember what you did last night, hopefully, or, or half remember what you did last night and think, oh, can I capture that again? So you just, by concentrating on the technical aspect of it, I think, and by tr- trying to become better at what you're doing, then it sort of is a fascinating exercise for you um, and it, certainly 10 or 15 years ago, that wasn't the case. I'd get bored of a show and, and, and annoyed if the audience weren't with me and rush through it if, if the audience didn't seem to be on my side. Uh, but now I will just, you know, if the, if the audience isn't going for it, I would be trying harder to make them go for it and trying to make them have a good time. I think, again, I've much more got to the point where I've realised people have paid money to see me, which is an amazing privilege. But also I should be giving, this is their night off, you know. And as a parent, you suddenly go, that could be their one night off a month or a year or, you know, six, every six months or whatever. So I want to entertain them. And if they're having a bad time, I've got to try and turn that around and make it into a good time for them. So not get angry with the people who turned up to see you. If, they, if there's a small number of people, um, they're the people who came to see you. So they, you've got to make them feel good. Um, but yeah, I just think I've, I'm fascinated by trying to be, become better at what I'm doing all the time. Uh, and you do, you know, every six months think, ah, oh, now I get it. And then six months later, I go, oh, no, no, now I get it. So you become just better and better at what you're doing. So, again, you know, it's sort of, I'm really lucky because, you know, I could have done Talking Cock very easily. That could have been like, hey, come and do a, a show on TV about cocks and, and then present this and then present this and then be on this game show and then this panel show. And I would probably never have done stand up again. But because I've, re- you know, I've, I've maintained this level of being good enough for people to come and see me and well known for people to come and see me, but not well known enough to be taken off to do other stuff. I'm hopefully getting just really, really good at being a stand-up comedian by just doing it again and again. Um, and it wasn't what I wanted to do, you know, it wasn't what I was interested in when I started. I wanted to, you know, so I'd probably like to be someone like David Mitchell, you know, when I started, I'd like to be doing panel shows and, and sitcoms and, you know, and just being kind of a witty bon viveur. Um, but uh, now I see myself as a stand-up, you know, and so it's... You know, you just you just keep pushing yourself to get better and better, and you get better at it by doing it. And you know, I've done 15, 12, 12 shows, there's yeah, twelve different shows in fifteen years, um, which most people just don't get the opportunity to do because either you become too successful or not successful enough. Uh, and even like this, you know, Jimmy Carr does fifth, has already done fifteen shows, um, but you know, it's very rare for someone successful to do that to do that much work. Um, <laughs> So what well, it is because no, you be a, no, no. and also it's very rare for you know that's why Stu's good again because he always writes his own stuff which most most of them don't when they become that successful but again I think that's really important you become better as a writer you become better as a performer and you know by putting your heart and soul into it then it means something and it's not just turning up and you know reciting someone else's jokes yeah so it's um you know so that's that's I you know the understanding how fortunate I am and and struggle you know always striving to be better at what I do because you know and I, I've never been that kind of personality who would think oh I'm the best I'm fantastic uh, I've always been like quite the opposite of like you know people don't need to criticize me because I will be doing that myself <laughs> yeah. so so uh no, you no know. feeling so but you know but so you just but then you use that to keep pushing yourself and get better so you know I'm glad that I'm not I was never the act coming off going yeah I was I stormed it I was the best tonight I ne- that never I would always come off even if I was the best I wouldn't wouldn't have known it I wouldn't have noticed because I would have been too critical of what I'm doing but that self criticism as long as it's not self destructive um is how you become better at what you're doing so you know I find the whole pro I find you know performing is just amazing weird it's a weird thing and I've just got like a voice you know half the time you're just commentating in your head about how weird this is what a strange way to make a living um no, the tightrope of it, you know, why are people, you know, what if people didn't laugh and they are laughing, isn't that fucking amazing? You're making all these strangers in a room laugh. And how have I done that? <laughs> and, you know, and that will it, will it stop? And can you, you know, I have, I have a very critical voice in my head that's trying to ruin the show for me as well. <clears throat> so it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, so all, I find all those stuff, all that stuff fascinating. But I think just, you know, it'd be nice. I hope I do get another 20 or 30 years at it because it'd be just great. I'd love to see how, 
how good I am at the end of it. I might not be as good, but I think I think generally you are. You know, you do you do get better, and you you're learning all the time, and uh, you know. That's what I guess. That's the things that annoy me about review. You'll get a reviewer in who'll sort of criticise and say, "Oh, you know, he doesn't understand this about comedy. Doesn't understand that about comedy." You go, "You know, I know a lot more about comedy than <laughs> a. I do it, but b. I've really thought about things. So the choices I've made aren't casual. Yeah. Uh, even if you disagree with the choices, or even if you know, you oh, that's a bit of an obvious thing to go. Well, you know, if you think it's obvious, then maybe I think it's obvious, and maybe I'm doing it for another reason than you're yeah. assuming. So maybe you're not clever enough to get why I'm doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, so a lot, a lot of critics will be like, "Oh, he's done something about." this subject and that's very hack and you go no 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 subjects hack no yeah. subjects hack. it's the way you do it that's hack you can't say the subject loads of comedians are doing that subject yeah so brexit you can't say loads of comedians are doing brexit so that that's a rubbish joke it's a better joke if you come up with it if everyone's doing it yeah. you come up with the right joke about it it's a, it's a brilliant joke yeah. so you know there's there's loads of ways that you kind of you know you it's that's a, you know it's a weird thing that not many people would be confident enough to be so critical with so many un, unqualified people would be comfortable to be that critical of someone who was that practiced as <laughs> something uh but you know i suppose that is the critic's job um but uh yeah yeah but you know i think i think it's i think all all comedians and the ones you don't like and the ones you think are rubbish generally think very hard about what they're doing and have, have come to a decision to uh, to do that for a reason yeah. Uh, it might not be the right reason or it might not be the right reason for you but it's maybe the right reason for them so um, you know and I think comedians think much more about stuff than most people think they do no, I, was, I was only laughing because um, the, the third joke in my current show I did a thing last night right. and uh, it's it's where I say uh, you, there's a rule where you have to start with your second best joke and end with your best joke yeah. so what comes now is about 46 minutes of filler yeah. and this person came up to me afterwards and went you should not end on that joke it's too good to end on and I was like <laughs> I said at the start you're gonna, you you got to wait for it but it's going to be worth it and it was like what are you don't give me that feedback like that's exactly what I was working towards so. but you know you know you you might not get it right it's good to have critics and it's good to be it's good to you know it's good not to assume you definitely know what you're doing but I think it's it's a sort of weird thing where people will I mean that's that they don't make the leap to think well maybe he's doing it for a reason or maybe you know maybe he knows as much about comedy as I do and knows this already so maybe there's something else that I should be thinking about. You know, you could. But that's the problem with comedies: is back and forth. So you're double bluffing and bluffing and double, triple bluffing and going back and forth. So you know, you could be subverting something, and people think you're doing the thing. Do you, Do you think a negative review affects you as much as it would have done in your earlier career? No, but sometimes they still do. Sometimes it just weirdly, most of them I completely just laugh off. But it's occasionally something will just get you just weirdly so it's you know and and, and it'll just then nag every time that bit comes up it'll be na there'll be that thing nagging at you in the, in in the voice whatever it was a tweet or something you know but mostly not at all and weirdly often from idiotic comments from people who don't know what they're talking about will just make me so angry that um that it will then affect that bit and I might have to even drop it because I'm you know because then it isn't funny because then I'm delivering it wrong so but mostly I you know I don't I you get to the point where you really you know people think like on Twitter, I'm going to tell you the truth and I don't think you're funny. You go, do you think I think everyone thinks I'm funny? <laughs> you know, because I really don't. I sort of am surprised if anyone find, thinks I'm funny. So, you know, I'm not disappointed if someone doesn't. And I'd be disappointed if everyone found me funny anyway, because that would be weird. Um, but, you know, it's not your, your opinion might matter to you, but it doesn't really matter that much to me. If nobody found me funny, that's a problem. Mm. But like, you know, even if, you know, most people don't know who I am. And most people wouldn't find me funny, but that doesn't matter as long as you know there's this core of people who do find me funny, and I find me funny. That's all that matters. So you know, most of those criticisms, you just think, well, you're weird because you think your criticism, you think your opinion means that much. Mm. And I think again, the older you get, the more I kind of just think those those subjective things, like a taste in music or comedy or whatever, are so stupid that you could, if you know, that that's fine. That's your that's your subjective opinion, but to then think, oh, it makes me better than other people because I like this is crazy. Because it's like nothing; it's not important anyway. It's not important what band you like. So liking a different band to, you know, people always didn't like Phil Collins, and you go, oh, if you like Phil Collins, you're naff. But you know, you're still just it's all just tinky tinkle tinkle, isn't it? And I don't like music, so that's why I think. You know, people like getting really obsessed about which music is best. You can think it's all just rubbish. So you know what your what your rubbish is still 
<laughs> Still as rubbish as that other person's rubbish. So, you know, I think to get upset about opinion is is odd. But, yeah, sometimes something for some reason infuriates you. But usually, no, I don't mind. And I, I, I don't I quite like to get, a, you know, criticism that you go, yeah, I think that is right. I think there is something in that. So those things don't annoy me. It's the ones that... I, where I feel aggrieved, it's like when people when when I feel people haven't understood that I know more about comedy than they do. Um, but things like that, I can obsess about. Um, but um, I'm I'm into it, uh, as in audience ticket wise rather than personally. But that's interesting. Yeah, you, that you took. That you oh, took well, I don't think it does. I don't think you know. Again, I don't think. Do you think people read the reviews anymore? Yeah, but I think, you know, a lot of times you get a bad review and people go, oh, that was a good review. And, you know, I went, I saw your review and so I came to see you because I saw your review. I got a three-star review in the Times. It was terrible. No, I saw it. So I saw it. Three stars. That was good. So, you know, it's a different perception, mm. but it's also just publicity for your show, you know. So even if I see a bad review for something, often I don't like the reviewer and I go, oh, I didn't know that thing was on. I'll go and see that. Mm. So, you know, it's that. I don't think it. I mean, if you get stinkers, but if you get real stinkers, then more people come anyway because, um, you know, they want to see this terrible show. So uh, I don't think it. I don't. I think if you get loads of good reviews, that can impact, impact on your ticketing. But I don't think the reviews really. You know, I got. When I did Lord of the Dance OT, I got really good write ups. So I got an amazing review in The Scotsman. I got pretty good reviews on, on that, you know, given it's Edinburgh and most of the reviews are written by. Um, people who've never seen comedy before, <laughs> um, you know, I got really good reviews, and it didn't make any, you know, I didn't get didn't get any more ticket sales as a result. Okay. So um, there's something more to it than that, you know. I think there's, and but there is, there's a definitely like a hill you're climbing, and then it gets you rolling down the other side. But it's, um, it doesn't necessarily follow. But I, d- I don't think a bad review. Well, who knows? I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to say, isn't it? Because the people don't come if, if they don't come, so you don't know if they would have come. Mm. Uh, but you know I, I always it seems to me regardless I always get sort of the number of people that I get and it sometimes goes up a bit sometimes it levels out for a little while um, but I don't think it's anything to do with the reviews and in, t- in terms of staying in contact with your fans yeah. obviously you're on quite a lot of different platforms do you, do you like being on social media does it annoy you too much Is um, I used to really love it and when Twitter started it was amazing and uh, you know I like chatting about comedy to people who like comedy and I like fans of my mind and you know, that's all positive and I don't even mind people who don't like it I, I don't understand I kind of find it fascinating that someone would seek you out to tell you they don't like you I think that's more interesting than them not liking you <laughs> uh, so I kind of I kind of quite enjoy the trolls to an extent as well um, yeah no, when I, you know, I think it's fun I think, it, I think it's, most of it's really good um, and yeah, you know, after a gig, I'll you know if I'm if I'm in a hotel bar and I'll dick around for a bit with people and people will join in. I think that's that's a really lovely social thing. And yeah, I think the I think for me the internet and and being in in with all Twitter and social media has definitely helped me keep the kind of fan base that I wouldn't have. I don't think I would have you know without the podcasts. I'm not sure to what level I would be working still. I mean, I think I'd still be in the business, but I don't think I'd be. Without doing the podcast, without Chris Evans filming my gigs, uh, and you know, without com- definitely without coming back to do stand up, but you know, I, the, I, the, I don't know where my career would be without the without the podcast, really. Yeah, I was going to ask about. I met Chris the other day. I was in um, yeah. Cardiff, and yeah, we were, we were talking about go faster, and I was wondering like what impact personally and professionally you you've benefited. from. Yeah, I mean, that. it's been amazing because because you know, a he does all the stupid things I want to do. Um, but you know also just being able to have your show at the end of the tour you know like Christ and Mike and Twin Cock I thought were great shows and they just disappeared and no one ever wanted to do film them <laughs> and then they were gone you know and that was just depressing but then just to think oh it still exists someone can still find it now if they want to find it it's just a really nice so mm. you know it just means there's that thing it still exists I can still go back and look at it and relearn it if I wanted to do it again uh, and you know it just it just it feels like a, a big deal and then you know and then you're getting new fans and you're getting a bit more revenue from it increasingly less because DVDs aren't really selling but um, you know it's not really about that it's more about the uh, but you know having Chris and having a, that means to film things cheaply and having someone keen to make things happen who isn't interested in anything other than making comedy that he likes it's just like amazing so I think without that and without you know without doing the podcasts and um, yeah I don't know I mean I'd probably be writing I think I'd probably be doing comedy I'm not sure I'd be performing as much it's hard to know isn't it? I mean you know if I, if I didn't if I hadn't got to the point where touring became you know it became a way of me earning enough money to live on for the year really um, by doing three or four months touring, but it would ten years ago it certainly wasn't that. Um, 
then without that, I don't, you know, I don't know where because it means that I can do all the free stuff and and you know I earn money still for the rest of the year, but from other things. But it just gives you that freedom, uh, and I don't think I'd have the, without the podcast. I wouldn't have the audience, and I think without Chris, maybe I wouldn't have the uh, have that as well. Okay, you quick fire for me. You take as long as you need, but obviously, yeah, fair enough. Okay. Um, what is the best show you've ever seen? <sighs> um, difficult to say. I really, Billy Connolly did it. We just went to see him in the late nineties. Do a show at the Hampstead Apollo, which was just like a real masterclass in keeping a big audience engaged, but still doing crazy sprawling stories. So that's probably yeah, that was one of the one of the ones certainly. Okay, what is the biggest mistake you've ever made, and how did you overcome it? Um, and, you know, I don't. You know, it's hard. It's hard to quantify. I don't, but again, I think it's the the mis- making whatever the mistakes are. They're really they're more important than the than the uh, the things you do well. So you overcome them by learning from them and moving on. Um, so you know, like I don't know, we didn't. So we did. We could, were writing on the day to day, and we ended up not writing on the day to day. But I think the reasons we ended up not writing, not writing on it were good. But you know, that could that was it felt like a disaster at the time because it felt like and was it sort of that I was correct it felt like we were absenting ourselves from the Monty Python of our generation which we sort of were um, but you know then you get on and do something else cool <laughs> who, who is the most underrated person in the comedy industry it is me <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's loads of you know some of those br- brilliant loads of so brilliant comedians Simon Munnery Bruvby Gratho is fantastic there's loads of people who are great and they don't push themselves in the same way as uh, the people who are successful do. So most people will never hear of them. I think Simon Munnery is, you know, might be, aside from him not, you know, he, he's, he's, he doesn't always come up with loads of new stuff, but the stuff he does is just so phenomenally good. But he's not, you know, he's not interested in the world that they're uh, getting to the other side of the world. So, you know, he wants to be this figure that he is, I suppose. So maybe okay. he's re- maybe he's rated correctly. I don't know. Uh, what is the biggest problem in the comedy industry and how would you go about solving it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, there's loads of stuff, but I think, and I, but I think, you know, you can, I think you, you, lots of people are looking for reasons that they themselves are not doing too well or why they, you know, why they've been overlooked. And, and I think just, you've just got to get on with what you do and, and enjoy it for itself. So I think probably... You know that the comedian's own attitude is as much as a problem as all the things that are annoying and are wrong. Um, I think you know, in TV terms, not. I think what I would change is I would go back to just the executives choose people they think are funny and think they know can do stuff, and then just let them get on with it. And I think that that's what's really changed on TV comedy, and it hard. That's why Stewart's an exception. That he's been, you know, all the things that good. Armando Yanucci, let him fucking get on with it. And he'll produce fantastic stuff for you. And that shit, Ricky Gervais, let him get on with it. And, you know, he'll make he'll make what he makes. And, uh, you know, so you've just got to, they've got their job should be to choose the people who are good, not to tell them the people what they should be doing or putting together teams of people. You, you know, you should be trusting the talent, really. And I think if you do trust the right talent, you'll get the best shows okay last question mm-hmm. if you could go back to any point in your career yeah. and give yourself one bit of advice you wish you had at the time what would it have been um, well you know but there's I don't I've, the, all the things I would I did wrong and the, uh, that I still do wrong I don't think I'd want to change anything um, you know I think it was all you know I'm not good at networking I'm not good at um, pushing myself and uh just trying to think if there's any point that I could have gone back and changed anything. You know, so I wouldn't go, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go back to the day to day and say you should do the day to day because I think it was probably right for us that we didn't. We, you know, and what you lose is what all my time travel stuff's about. Isn't it? What you lose is so much. You don't know where you would end up. If you, you even if you would made yourself incredibly successful, you might not be as happy. Um, I don't know. Uh, kill Stuart Lee the first time I met him. <laughs> that would be it. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, I, I don't know. I wouldn't. I, said, I, don't, I wouldn't really want to change anything. I, and and it's it's sort of w- weird because you know I think I, I, I'd, if you'd asked me 15 years ago, I'd change loads of stuff. Uh, but uh, maybe just me more confident. Uh, and yeah, you know, well, maybe maybe Karen doing stand up. But again, I think if I had carried on doing stand up, I would have been a different person as well. Maybe I should have per- persevered when I hated doing stand up in the early nineteen nineties. But you know, why force yourself to do something you don't not ready to do? 
and would it have, would it have worked would I've would I've been the person I am now if I'd done that so uh I think you just have to be quite fatalistic about it once things have happened I think you can do, you can affect things in the future uh but uh be better at remembering who executives are so when you see them a second time you go hello to them rather than not realizing who they are um but I still can't do that no I'm not a good person to ask ask someone successful what they <laughs> what they would do because that, they that's why they're successful okay well thank you very much for thank coming thank you in. no problem that was Richard I love his work, work ethic I love how he manages so many projects and family life and just manages to keep motivated and keep going even with his struggles and anxieties and just I feel like everyone could learn something from him I feel like uh, I have a lot of friends who complain about writer's block who complain about uh, you know sort of self-imposed deadlines and not being able to sort of stick to them and I think it's a good habit to get into the fact that he's able to stick to deadlines the fact that he's able to push himself and go right how many projects can I do how many podcasts can I make how you know why should I wait for a tv commissioner to to give me the permission to do this when I can make it and put it up myself and if I get enough people to donate to it I might even be able to break even on it so th- that's something I love that's an ethic that I really stick behind that's something that I'm doing as best I can and and uh, hopefully building an audience for myself uh, yeah I hope you got something out of that I hope you found it as motivating and as inspiring as I did I, I, I can't thank him enough for giving up his time and for sp- supporting the podcast if you want to thank him his twitter handle is in the show notes so please do go and thank him it really helps out to thank the guests because it means if I need to ask a previous guest to put on a another guest or to put me in touch with a future guest they're more receptive to do it because they're like oh there's a really good audience there that are listening to the episodes and are really appreciative so if you can and if you're on twitter please do tweet him and say thank you if you got any value out of it as i said before uh, myself and richard are both at the edinburgh fringe festival richard is at the pleasance courtyard every single day at 7 30 p.m doing a show called oh frig i'm 50 the prices will vary on the day depending on whether it's a two for one or a special offer or whatever have a look in the show notes you'll be able to find him he's also doing a tour after the fringe i am at the edinburgh fringe in sweets venue every day except wednesday every day except wednesday when i get rudely awoken by the dustman uh, at 5 p.m uh, it's five pound uh, if you want to reserve a seat or it is pay what you want on exit so please do come and support me it would be really really appreciated as uh, yeah i put a lot of work into these and if you like hearing my voice you might like seeing my face as well so yeah please do support me if you can't do that if you're new please do subscribe if you're old please do give us an honest review on itunes they really help I'm, I, i've sort of i need to find new ways of saying these but yeah they do help and they and they mean a lot they help chart positionings they also help with future guests to know that there are people coming on and it's, it's just useful just seriously leave a review it doesn't take very long you can do it now while i'm talking i don't mind also you can donate money to the podcast to keep it going the uh, website is Simon Kane credit uk there you can donate a one-off on paypal or you can just sign up as a patreon which means you give a certain amount per episode which uh, starts at one dollar because it's an american site one dollar is about 80p if you think this is worth 80p please chuck it my way if you want to give more than that if you want to give more than a fiver do consider just buying my book my book's called how to make a living by working for free and it is about building a community around your free content online and asking them to support you in order to keep it going much like what i'm doing right now So if you'd like to buy a copy of that, there's hardback copies of the book, but there's also digital downloads from £5. So if you'd like to do that, you can. It gives you something back for your money. That'd be really great. That'd be lovely. Thank you so much. That's all for me from now. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for donating. And thank you very much for coming to see me at the Edinburgh Fringe. If you do, I'll see you all in about 15 days time. Bye.